Hello and welcome back to Teach Talk with the Fine Arts. My name is Sarah and I'm your host. Today I have a pretty special guest on here and it happens to be my husband, Jeremy. Jeremy, do you want to introduce yourself? Well, I'd rather let people introduce me because I'm not the best at words. But uh, like she said, my name is Jeremy and uh, I'm actually across. But there's a window between us, so that's also a little bit of a pressure situation. I guess you could say my education of music started at birth and because my dad, he uh, he grew up with music. And in fact, he picked it up from his sister who learned to play piano uh, by music, but then he decided he was going to pick it up by ear. And that's how he developed that. But uh, through that education, I kind of been been around that all my life because he was a pastor. So I that might's when I really started my education with music was just being in church and uh I just decided one day, okay, I'm gonna learn this because not only my dad was playing music, but both of my brothers were playing music. My oldest brother plays bass, my second oldest brother, he plays drums, and so naturally I would gravitate towards something. Um but I learned drums first. I learned drums first, and then one once uh, fifth grade come around, I just happened to be in like an excellent school program at fifth grade, and uh, I said, "Well, my brother exposed me to Kenny G at the time, so I was like, well, I'm gonna learn how to play house. I'm gonna learn how to play saxophone." So that's kind of what started my journey with saxophone too, and all the while. Uh, all the while, I was uh, around my dad when he was recording people uh, as a hobby, you know, recording albums and stuff. But um, we'll get to that later because as I was going into high school, I, I moved between uh, three or four different counties in uh, West Virginia and Ohio. But once I, I hit Bridgeport High School, I... Uh, started to really develop my musicianship because it was a it was a huge program and uh from there I, I realized that I, I wanted to pursue this further so as I was playing in high school I was also playing in church and I was trying to uh develop both at the same time and on top of that I uh started listening to more jazz other than Kenny G uh, just a lot of the influences that uh I learned from uh, the high school big band and things like that, and I just kept, just kept digging and digging and digging and finding what my sound is as far as that goes. What my interest problem is, my interests go they're vast and and wide, so I can't really put a finger on what that exactly is, as far as like what my my tastes are. I guess it just kind of just changes from day to day, but uh, that also led to. Uh, my love for recording too on top of that um it wasn't until like 2008 that i started learning to record and uh i just kind of dabbled with it it was it was mo mostly because i was in a band at the time and uh when i was in the band i was like man i need to learn how to do this because we were re being recorded as well you know demo tapes and stuff and started to really like it to a degree and then on top of that I was learning technology with uh, what is called a wind synthesizer I was like wow you know wind instruments aren't limited to just uh, wind instruments uh, there's there's a lot of options out there such as the Ewe and uh, the Yamaha wind synth and things like that around 2010 I started studying co uh, in college because my parents couldn't really afford it I mean, they just made too much, supposedly. From there, I I originally wanted to go into music, but people were like, "Oh, but you need something to lean, you know, fall back on. You can always do music, but you need something to fall back on." I'm just like, "Okay." So I, I gave into that study. It started studying IT, and uh, you know, of course, IT means computers with uh, systems maintenance and programming too. And uh, found that I, I, it wasn't really so much a fit at the time. And I think it was because I was still trying to figure out myself as far as what I wanted to do as a career. 
And uh, that led me to three years later saying, hey, I, I need to do what I know I need to do inside my heart and uh, heart and soul, which is music. So around 2013, I, I studied uh, music education at West Virginia State University. And about two years into that, I the, the, the music program started expanding into uh, performance, BFA in other words. And uh, that's when I, I, I was starting to get burned out with the music education portion. And uh, said, maybe I should try the performance thing because maybe if I try to focus more on the music instead of these other classes, maybe I, perhaps I can really do something, I mean, just really put in the time. And uh, unfortunately, I got burned out with that. But uh, so I had to kind of collect myself. I had to drop out uh, due to mental health reasons and also just stress and things like that. But also, I think my interests were starting to change in a lot of ways too. So, but the, but but the the fact that remained is that I was still getting into recording. So it wasn't like I was, uh, I wasn't so much dropping dropping anything. I was still heavily involved with music either way, either playing in a band or in church or recording. So I just realized that it was just too much at the time. So. Since 20, 2015, 2016, I've been recording albums for people and uh, just getting more into the engineering part. And that's basically it for as far as that goes uh, up to 2020. Cool. I didn't actually know the logistics behind the BFA and the music education part. It kind of blew my mind at first when I realized that people were studying BFA like they weren't taking the education classes. It was almost like a, a a cross between regents and education. Like they were just doing the performance part, making them do more material, but they didn't have a BFA degree for it yet. It took, like I said, it took until like maybe somewhere in 2015, yeah, about 2015, right when I just started. I mean, I just explained that. But uh, yeah, it wasn't an official degree until 2015. Yeah, I think they tried to get us one, but it went through. So that's why I have the inner disc part. Mm -hmm. So basically, you put in a lot of work your whole life, but a lot of people tend to not talk about that, and they just go on about how talented you are. What are your thoughts on that? It's kind of like what I said from the beginning. I said I, I'm not too much with uh, gathering a, I don't want to say a speech per se, or even like, you know, an explanation or at least, you know, building up myself with my own words. I learned from Charlie Parker from, you know, early on that uh, you let the music speak for itself mm -hmm. because, you know, your work is always going to, just like your actions speak louder than your words, it's the same thing. Let your music speak louder than you saying how good you are. You know, if you're good, people are going to know. You don't have to say it. And, and, Miles Davis had said it himself that he said, I can tell the kind of musician that person is by the way they pick up their instrument and the way they live their life and the way they carry themselves. He said, I don't even have to hear a note. In other words, that's an indirect quote, but that's, that's the gist of what he was saying in interviews when people ask him, you know, how, how did he pick out, pick his musicians? Because up until like the fifties, um, after the birth of the cool, everybody wanted to be in his band. So it's like, huh, how do you pick, right? Do you think talent is uh, basically not real and something people just say because they don't realize the hard work that goes into it? Or do you think there's actually something, do you think talent actually has something to it? I think it's more work than anything else. But there has to be some kind of early development and... I'm going to take a, a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Take a, take a reference from Rick Beato on YouTube. He says that he, he, he had a long description, like multiple videos explaining why perf there's a difference between perfect pitch and relative pitch and where most people think they have perfect pitch 
and he said he he uh, further explained what's the difference and what most people have unless they were like uh, trained up into their like early infancy because they have to hear that before they even start developing in the instrument on the physically uh, because you know you know they always consider the first like what is it one to three years for like an infant it's like the genius years I think they call it that. I have the numbers wrong, but it's basically the same thing that a lot of your development is early on as far as the natural part, that's the nurturing part. But as far as the musician part, you have to put your time in. Mm -hmm. You have to put your time in. But one thing I learned from college and I had, in in my opinion and, and, and from all the other teachers I've met over the years and musicians, uh, my professor at West Virginia State, he said that you have to have a life outside of music. You can't, you cannot stay in the practice room. You just don't learn anything from that. So it's not just playing itself. You have to have, you know, for instance, your weekends, you know, go out, take a walk, things like that, because your the music itself is, uh, built in from you and in your life itself because otherwise you don't have a story to tell. Mm-hmm. And it's just like Willie Nelson said, and I, I like, this is one of my favorite quotes, he says, you can't even start a record, record, you can't have a record without something to say, in other words. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but as far as the talent goes, I feel like I'm kind of going in circles, but as far as talent goes, um, there's always that development and how that development is. It really depends on, um, what needs to be done as far as your, um, the facility part, you know, your hands and, uh, like let's say a drum kit, you got your all, you know, all four limbs and also the mental part. So, um, in that regard, that's, that's like your, that's your rote, that's your, uh, facility, you know, getting your limbs in sync. And for instance, saxophone, I don't mean to elaborate too far, far but uh, with saxophone, you don't have just the fingers and blowing. You also have to have make sure that this articulation and your embouchure and your tongue and your wind breath control, um, there's so many aspects to that as well. Same thing with drums. But uh, even at that, that's just one aspect of the music. You know, it, if you, as far as being a musician, uh, there's also the heart of it and the, and the head. So you have to have a good balance of all the three things. Um, it's like what David Liebman says. He's another famous saxophone player. He said, it's the three H's, hand, head, and heart. And, uh, I think that's basically it as far as that. When a lot of people in a certain family are music related, it kind of seems you think that it would be inherited. Do you think it like is genetic in a way? I think a lot of it is the nurturing, to be mm-hmm. honest. I mean, just for instance, let's, I, I'm just saying, for example, let's say somebody's adopted and they never met their, you know, family before, they would have to have those genius years first. Mm-hmm. And just growing up in it, I would like to see examples. I would like to to know some examples as far as that goes. But I mean, people talk about movies like August Rush. You know, they always want to mention August Rush. Uh, you know, the kid that was found in Manhattan and then he was taken uh, by some some guy who was trying to bank bank off of him. But that's because his 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 parents. Uh, were musicians themselves. He must have, I mean, in reality, he he would have had them to meet them at some point and been around them enough to hear it early on and then pick it up. Mm-hmm. And I think it also, and that's part of the reason I love August Rush in particular, is because, as we were talking about earlier, you have to have a life to live too, because of all the hardship he had in his life with uh, being separated from his family his biological family, he uh, used that 
to put in, pour into the music that was already inside of him uh, that he was continually developing too. So sometimes they miss those little details in movies, but yeah. I forgot about that movie. I watched it a few years ago. One of my best friends, he uh, he named his child af- uh, after the, the character, August. And uh, every time I, I think about that, I, I don't really so much giggle, but I'm just like, you know, it's it's just cool because I know that's that's just us loving the music so much. Um, even my uh, saxophone teacher, he named his son Miles, mm-hmm. and I believe for the same reason. But those are cool names. I mean, I like them. So uh, I want to kind of compare our college experiences. So, so my juries were basically regular juries. The junior and senior hearings were different. But regular juries, it was like less than 10 minutes of music you've worked on the semester and they critique you. And that was the whole jury experience. I know you had like skill juries and content juries. Can you just kind of explain that? I always was reminded from my teacher, my uh, advisor slash mentor, that in a way we had it easy because he, he when he went to Marshall, he said that... Uh, they had to know all their scales prior and what they're working on currently. So he used that a lot. Um, I'll explain that in just a second. But for the most part, you had to learn it at, at Marshall University. You had to learn it at, like, I don't know, 120 beats per minute or more. Just super fast. And I may not be 100% accurate on that, but it was definitely much faster than what we learned it. You know, he had a benchmark for us, you know, at a certain temp- tempo. And as long as we were consistent with all our scales, all 12 all uh, twelve keys, that uh, we'd be ready for the scale juries. But as far as our scale juries go, um, it was different from uh, teacher to teacher. I think we, I don't know if we had it the hardest so much, but I know he, he used it a lot of what he had learned from other colleges. So he was pretty tough on us. But that's because we were capable for the most part. Let's say the first semester was all major scales. Before he came over, came to West Virginia State, he said, uh, and I heard it from other students, then you would play the natural minor scales. And uh, he's like, well, if you know the major scales, then you know your natural minor scales. So because it's just a minor third below the root or a major sixth. Uh, but he said, uh, instead of that, we went from major scales and then the modes. And what did we do next? We did the diminished whole tones. And I forget what else exactly. But it, but ultimately, we had to do them all. Like the next semester, I had to do my major scales and my modes and then vice versa. Now, the second half of the semester, that was always the first half of the semester, the second half of the semester was, was what they called lit juries, where we had like uh, maybe a slow piece and a fast piece. Sometimes they'd be combined uh, with one piece, depending on the difficulty level of it. Because mine was different, like later on. But when he first, when I first uh, went went to went to college, they uh, gave me a like a uh, accompanied piece with piano, piano complement. And then an etude, maybe faster or slower. And uh, he basically flexed it, uh, depending on us as, as as students. And again, every teacher, as far as their concentration, you know, their emphasis, instrumental emphasis, they uh, they flexed it to what they need. But they also like kind of had a standard. On top of that, they would normally like. It's it, They were kind of flexible with us because our, our college was so small. Uh, in fact, sometimes they were too flexible or too nice about it. Um, but within reason, because if you failed it, then you would just have to go back and do it the next semester or make it up somehow mm-hmm. or maybe make it up on your lit jury. And so they, they were, they were uh, gracious about that. Uh, thankfully, I never had to do that. But um, I'm trying to think of what else as far as that goes. But I think I covered it all. 
So you did two per semester. Mm -hmm. Okay. Going back on what I said, basically, yeah, I, I flipped around with teachers a lot. So, and it did vary teacher by teacher. Yeah. So some people did scales. I think I actually did scales my first jury. Yeah, I think I played all the major scales on marimba. Okay. But yeah, it did vary teacher to teacher. But most of mine were like 10 minutes of music that I'd worked on the semester. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I knew I know you grew up with music and I feel like for you and probably a lot of other people going from that to like sheet music was hard because I grew up with sheet music. I learned sheet music. So going from sheet music to not using sheet music is hard. Is that true for you? I believe every person has a unique, like, their situation is unique. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that being said, I, I totally forgot to mention in the beginning that I took piano lessons for, like, a year. Mm -hmm. It don't even feel like, it felt like a year. I think it was around six months, to be honest. And uh, my teacher, when I was in Ohio, she covered theory, but where I was... Not really interested, but I was. I just didn't have a practice ethic. I just didn't know. I, I, I was so, like, hyperactive as far as, like, me as a person that I probably, a lot of things just went whoosh, right over my head because I wasn't paying attention. But she would, like, mark up. My, pay, my pages were, like, so marked up. It was, like, almost solid black just trying to get me to, to learn the pieces uh, because my practice ethic was like Zippo, uh, I wouldn't say Zippo, but but yeah, it was it was it was, it just wasn't what it needed to be as far as uh, excelling as a piano um, as a pianist. But uh, sight reading, I I believe that I would have done a lot better if I'd stuck with it. Who knows if I would have stuck with just piano, saxophone, but or saxophone, whatever. But uh, yeah, sight reading was just so tough for me. And you would think it wouldn't be bad because I'm a drummer. But for the most part, um, that's what my saxophone teacher said I struggled with the most. He said, you got the notes, but your rhythm is you need to work on the most. And uh, as far as that goes, I mean, it's just, yeah, I struggled a lot with that. But I, I mostly... Uh, I mean, but with that, I, I, I had to memorize the music, in other words. Of course, learning s so many songs through memorization like that, they start to overlap. And so I understood what I was reading, but as far as like, uh, it was like, it's kind of like trying to read a book. If you don't look ahead just enough, you get hung up. Mm -hmm. And I know when we read sometimes together, I, I deal with that sometimes, especially when I'm tired. I'll get hung up on a word or somehow distracted or something. And I feel like it's, I know for a fact, that's the way it is with music too. It's a lot like, it is a language. And it, I, I don't even have reservations about that saying, that it's a language just like reading and writing. So if if you don't have the ability to read, I mean, you're probably not going to, you may have good excel i mean you may be able to excel with writing but as far as your reading you're going to be stunted in some ways uh so i advocate learning all that you can which also leads to also i mean at least also leads to music theory as well people's like oh music theory will stunt your creativity i'm like not really it it's it's not that's not what it's designed to do it's to help you not only understand what you're reading and where the hist the history of it comes from, but to help you learn how to not only understand the rules, but know when you can break them too, mm -hmm. or when something can be opened up for interpretation. And I love theory, even though I was not the greatest. I'm not the greatest sight reader, but when uh, third and fourth semester came came about, I mean came along. We were getting into territory where, like, a student would give an answer during lectures, and he'd say, you can argue that. And I'm just like, Pfft. compared to the, la you know, the last two semesters, like, no, this is how it is. Mm -hmm. But, again, it goes back to the fact that you got to know the basics, and it helps to know the—you have to have that foundation and know the rules 
just like counterpoint. I, I can't believe I just said that. Is that a cuss word? Some people to some people counterpoint is a cuss word. <laughs> but yeah, I mean learning all that helps you learn to break the rules and know how to go from there too. So Yeah, when we had theory it was um basically you you learn one and two and then three and four you forget everything else. Just forget everything you learn. <laughs> Yeah, I know my teacher was always disagree with that. It's like, yeah, you need to learn everything before, just like the scale juries and the lit juries. You need to remember everything you did before and only to move for move forward. It's just like uh, they say you need to learn the past in order to know what your future's, what the future is going to be like. Because seems like everything goes in circles. So, I mean, it was a joke, of course. Of course. But yeah. Yes. Sometimes I miss them, but that's okay. How long were you expected to practice, and did you practice longer? Well, I know with music education, they wanted you at least do two to three hours. And I don't think it really put a a number. The more the merrier, of course, with college, because you need to make use of that practice room. As the professors always said, make use of the practice room, because you won't have time when you when you actually get out there in the world. It's true. And it is true. Absolutely true. And uh, I remember master classes, musicians would be like, I don't ever have time to practice because I'm always playing. But, you know, it, it just depends. I guess it really depends on the person. But even the greatest musicians, even my favorite saxophone players of all time said they're always trying to develop and learn new things about it. I kind of forgot what the, the second half of the question did you practice that long every day? No, I didn't. And I think it also goes back to me personally uh, with ADHD and stuff like that. And then being overwhelmed and having to work a, a, a late evening job on top of that. So in other words, I had a lot of stuff. Pull, I had a lot of things pulling at me. And uh, I think I can definitely consider myself a procrastinator. So I would end up not taking everything and trying to cram it at one time, but I definitely tried to ramp it up towards the end. And just enough to know from myself and also the teacher that I was going in there and practicing. So there was a little there was a little bit of give and pull there. I I try I tried to do that when it came to trying to study towards the BFA. He was like, you know, the teacher was like six hours a day. You need to try at least get six six hours a day. And all the time, free time that you had before, it's out the door. And uh, it's true, because I remember my first lesson going into the BFA, I was uh, put in, I put literally six hours, and I, I counted it in my uh, in my notes, which I never really learned how to take notes, practice notes, even though they went over it with me numerous times. But after that first lesson, it seemed like I didn't even practice. It felt like I didn't practice at all, and it just. And as the semester went on, I just that first that first lesson just it broke me so bad because I was having a lot going on anyway. But it just seemed like after that, it kept piling up on top of each other. It just like, oh, you got you got to consider what you missed on this last lesson and keep piling on top of it. And I even told my teacher, I said. I feel like I'm having to pick up from where I left off. And he's like, that's just how it is with college lessons, and especially with a BFA. It's like, yeah, you need to catch up from what you did before. On top of that, I was actually taking two lessons. I was studying uh, applied jazz on top of uh, uh, private lessons, uh, applied music, which I would have loved the fact, I would have loved to just stick with jazz because the classical stuff, I love it, but it seemed like I was not really, it, it didn't feel very applicable outside of college, and it didn't feel so applicable. Uh, it does as far as the practice goes, because everybody likes to study Bach, and they'll say, well, we, then we could do a metal version of this, or jazz, but that's just because they basically laid the foundation. No, they did lay the foundation, in fact. Okay. Do you have anything to say about college or any advice for college people or anything like that? First of all, get yourself balanced as far as everything you need to do with uh, your life. Because when you're in college, 
that's what you need to be doing because it's going to take up all your time and it's going to take up everything. You're going to have days where you're so stressed that, I mean, it just seems like you're just trapped. And that's towards the end there because I had to, I, I was at that point where I needed to kind of gather myself. I felt trapped. I really did. And uh, that's nothing against the teachers, nothing against anybody in particular. But, you know, working and going to college and doing other things, you, you, you have to balance more the more you add to it. It's like they say irons in the fire when you got too many irons in the fire. I never quite understood that quote, but I, I, I can see that it means that uh, when you got too much on your plate that, you're just going. It's it's it's. You're going to eventually crash, or you're, something's going to happen to where you're not even useful uh, trying to study. It's like you can't even just digest the information. So, my advice to anybody, and my teachers warned me about this. You gotta you gotta you gotta think when you're in college. Am I going to college to be an employee? at your job or am I going to college to become a musician and become a teacher and to be a student? At first when I heard that I was just like, Really? You know, I mean, I gotta pay the bills. I gotta do all these other things. I gotta live. But it makes so much sense. It's like they're not saying drop everything. But you do have to have a balance. And and when you're in school, you're in school. So in, in all that money that you're putting into uh, your loans and, you know, may, maybe if you live off-site, off-campus, you know, you got the gas and things like that. I don't mean to elaborate too much, but all these things you have to factor in. It's It's not as simply showing up to class and hoping you pass. <laughs> Sounds like some of my general education classes. But with music... You, you have everything. You have everything that, that falls into place. Everything bleeds into what you're doing. So um, Let's talk about recording now. So um, you talked about why you decided to start recording because of your dad. Uh, so what's your favorite part about recording? I like to think that I, I like the whole process. And it's like, I don't know if it's just my procrastinated mind, but it seems like I could start a project, but it's sometimes it's hard to, to finish it. So part of getting bigger projects is pushing myself to get them done. And, uh, of course, with getting them done, you get more clients. You get better clients. Uh, but as far as the process of recording, it seems like the journey of getting there is, is, is uh, the funnest part because you're like, okay, what's this going to – what, what – guitar part as far as your lead or your rhythm how's that going to fit with the rest of it that's the that's the fun part i think is is composing on the on the fly in other words you're like okay yeah this chord works but does it work here in this song this part of the song or does this uh this fingering does that work i think that's my favorite part is trying to figure out what's going to make this sound better and uh, one of my friends that uh, I call on as a studio musician, he said, man, I've, I've stuck with this quote ever since you said it. He said, it, focus on trying to get your takes. Try to get great takes because you can fix a lot later if you have to. But for the most part, the music itself, once it's on there and it sounds great, a lot of things you don't have to uh, labor over so much. But I think it's a combination of the mixing, mixing part, and uh, trying to make it sound like a, an entire picture, and the compositional part. Because as we spoke earlier about sight reading and learning theory, and uh, I don't know if we mentioned anything about composition, but it all kind of comes into play. Recording a lot, it, it, it's it's more like a microscopic focus on what's happening uh, during the recording process. Live performance, it seems like you can, a lot of things are 
compromise because you're the it's the room you're in, it's uh, how you're feeling that day. Well, recording has a lot to do with that too, how you're feeling that day. But all those factor in, and then also you have the room that you hear that and uh, and the crowd that you're feeding off of. But with recording, it's like you're really getting microscopic with it. As my teacher always said, the devil's in the details. So it's the composition part and the mixing part. It seems like it's a lot like cooking. I think it, when I think of those parts that, that are related to cooking, I think those are my favorite parts. What's your favorite doll and why? I've been bouncing between two or three different dolls right now, which means digital audio workstation for anybody that's wondering. Most of the time I work in Pro Tools. But sometimes I need to work in Studio One because of certain projects that are thrown at me uh, from studio musicians that I collaborate with or, or uh, artists or sometimes Logic, which I just picked that up recently. I, I used to record in Logic, and I got used to it. But it also, when I started to get back into it, I realized it's mostly what you use the most is like, maybe your favorite because you learn how to work in that workflow. You learn how to do everything. But as far as like well-roundedness, Pro Tools is my favorite. I just, there's just so many, but there's so many things about it as far as the editing process. And I think that harkens back to the whole mixing process. Uh, the editing process is, makes the mixing part easier. Yeah, I like Pro Tools for the fact that it's it, the editing capabilities of it, that you can work really fast in it. And if you know your keyboard shortcuts, uh, you can just be like, pfft, you can just fly like it's nothing. It just makes so much sense. Like they engineer it, they, they programmed it in such a way that they know that when somebody's using Pro Tools and, and, and like the studio situation, especially large facilities, which they cater mostly to larger facilities because a lot of older, um, older engineers, they're not willing to change so much. I don't want to say that entirely, but I mean, on record, but they try to think more, okay, what is the fastest way to do something mm -hmm. without the creativity flow? And uh, that even goes with the recording process too, with Pro Tools. Uh, there's so many shortcuts with it that I like that I don't have to think about what I'm doing. I just, for instance, if somebody needs to, to pick up in a section that first one i'd be like okay take me back to the first one okay keyboard shortcuts with the numeric pad boom punch in go and if you can keep that going without uh with little gaps between as far as time the, the creative flow just keeps going mm -hmm. and, I've, and i've learned that even with people that aren't experienced with recording if you're able to just keep that going they won't slow down. They'll they'll have that energy flowing. Uh, Studio One would be my second second favorite because again, it, a lot of it's what I'm used to, but it's also a combination of when I collaborated with a, a friend of mine. He had Cubase. I got him in the Studio One because I was using it more at the time. But then I realized using Cubase and Studio One, Cubase is a lot. It's very very close to what Studio One is. Of course, with trademarks and copyright, they couldn't make it exactly the same. But then I realized one of the people that helped develop Studio One, he came from the Cubase, uh, came from Cubase mm -hmm. when he was developing it. So, um, but the nice thing about Studio One especially is because it's so new compared to Pro Tools, which it, it came about in 1991 uh, as Sound Tools. But with Studio One, they're able to start almost from scratch and listen to the musicians and the engineers and the producers, which I feel like they it's more geared towards uh, engineering, not engineering, sorry, beat making and uh, the, the, the average bedroom producer. I think they, they geared toward more towards them, uh, those that are just mu used to just the, the clicks uh, of the mouse instead of the keyboard shortcuts. There's so many things about Studio One that I like that I'd love to, to uh, learn 
learn it more because for one thing, I paid for it. I don't have to worry about perpetual licensing like a lot of plug-in companies and Pro Tools is doing. So that's more of a preferential thing. But I'd say my two favorites are Pro Tools and Studio One just because they're, they both have a similar um, tool set that I'm used to doing as an engineer and sometimes as a producer. So do you ever get criticism when you're recording and how do you deal with that? Not too much. And I think a lot of it's because of the area that I live in. We live in, actually, because we're married, right? <laughs> Last time I checked. Last yeah. time you checked, yeah. Not too much. There's only two people that that give uh, me the most criticism, and they're, and they're friends. One of them is a client, an actual client, but he's also connected with my colleague that, uh, thankfully, he lives close. But he... Uh, my my colleague he he's a uh, 25 year Nashville uh, studio musician veteran. He started out as a live musician, but uh, he also did studio recording on the side as well. So when he talk when he when he uh, works with me, we've you know we've got that understanding that uh, you know as long as I'm on top of my my game that he's able to do what he does and we don't we don't overlap too much. But as far as like that goes, he doesn't uh give me too much criticism except, you know, just make sure that I'm doing the things I need to do to to uh keep the creative flow going, not a lot of gaps in between. In other words, when he's here and to record, I'm ready to go to. I mean there may be an occasional, oh, the cable's unhooked or something's not coming through with the gain staging or or uh the instrument itself, but for the most part, you know, just being ready to go, things like that. And actually, I've got one more person that uh, sometimes gives me criticism, but I haven't talked to him in a while. He said uh, when we were working together in Nashville, uh, it was like it was like a day session. He said, you know, you're great, but you just again, you got to be fast. You got to be on top of it. There's no dead air. Because that creativity flow, if it drops off, then it's just just like uh, earlier when I, I completely lost my train of thought, it's just hard to pick it back up. And then you lose your energy, you lose that creative flow, the juices as they call it. So more or less just being on top of it and uh, just being quick. Sweet. That's basically all I have. Do you have any comments or anything else to add to anything we've talked about or anything we haven't talked about as far as our conversation goes today i feel like i've overlapped one thing after another and just added to it uh but for the most part i've learned as a musician that it really pays to learn how to record and mm. it really pays because even my my college professor he said with recording when you practice, you, you you have instant feedback because you're not hearing things that uh, the recorder does. That recording doesn't lie unless you have uh, equipment that doesn't pick it up sufficiently, like a certain microphone or if it's the room or it's the recorder itself. But for the most part, recording yourself is, uh, is an invaluable tool because it don't lie. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't. So, and it'll make you a better musician. That's the most important thing about it. And if you know how to record and you're working with a musician that knows how to record, you can help each other. So, and it makes it, it makes the creativity flow just keep going. Cause if, if, if you're, if, if your friend's lacking, you can pick up where he may be lacking. And there's free ones too. You don't have to go out and buy pro tools and logic and all that. Um, I started on Audacity, and they also have, like, BandLab, and what are some other ones? What's funny about that is companies like Pro Tools and uh, Reaper, which Reaper does an evaluation, a 60-day evaluation. Pro Tools and Studio One, and I can't think of any other companies right off, but I know Pro Tools and Studio One, they have free versions. They're very limited mm -hmm. as far as what they're capable, but... They also do that, that you'll be, feel compelled to purchase 
you know, a license, an actual full, like full license. Uh, like you said, Audacity, there's a lot to that that um, they give you that you could do a lot with an album. In fact, I'll try not to go fully on record with, with this, but I heard Dragon Force did their first album on Audacity. I believe it. Yep. And uh, I've met other college musicians that said they started with Audacity and they did some pretty good stuff. So, you know, try not to let your equipment get in the way of the cre creativity flow. Because, again, back in the 50s and 40s, they didn't have the best equipment. In fact, even up into the uh, early 40s, they were cutting it in straight onto a record. So if you messed up, you had to throw the record out and just do it again. Mm -hmm. It's basically start to finish. At the same time, it would be... We would learn so much from that if we would just try to treat it like a unit instead of trying to punch in. Yeah. Because you're not playing just a section. You're playing a performance. Mm -hmm. So think of the big picture. And I think that's why a lot of what we're hearing in, in today's industry is so, it sounds, it just sounds almost lifeless. Not all the music, but a lot of it is because not only they're using processed instruments like MIDI and software instruments and uh, perfect timing quantizing. Also because it's like, you don't have to be a great musician anymore. You could just play a section, copy and paste. Mm -hmm. We all do it, but don't you think the music is suffering as a result? Mm -hmm. So that it's that imperfection, even just even the slight, that makes it seem like, oh, this is alive. So that's that's what I always think of when I'm recording. It's like, of course, I flex to the client. I, I adjust myself for the client. So maybe they do need to punch in, in certain sections. But for the most part, I think of it as a unit. And then also I try to think of, the big picture itself. Is that it? We can talk all day if you really wanted to. Well, we're at 51 minutes, so. I, I don't have anywhere to be. We could always do a part two. We can always do a part two, can't we? I kind of thought about not this episode, but ask it on Facebook if people wanted to do like a Q&A type of thing. Yes. I think that'd be neat. Yeah. Look out for that. Maybe ah. YouTube and all the other places that give comments, too. Yep. Because uh, mean criticism, you know, depends on what it is, but I always take things with a grain of salt. But even in my early uh, usage of YouTube, posting videos and stuff, I would try to learn from those comments, even the mean ones. I'd be like, why were they mean, you know? Uh, but at the same time, you always take things with a grain of salt. That's what I, and that's what I love about comments. It's like, well, why should I should I hold on to what they're saying, or why should I just reject it? Mm -hmm. So it's 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 like feeling strong for both. Well, if you're watching this on YouTube, which I know most of you are, can you leave a comment with questions for me and Jeremy, and we'll answer them in the part two. And if you're not watching this on YouTube, head over to my Facebook at Sarah Noel Percussion and shoot me a message. Or Instagram at Sarah Noel Percussion. And yeah, we'll kind of work on that in the near future. Yes. Jeremy, thank you for setting everything up, and thank you for letting me borrow your equipment for previous podcast episodes. It's kind of cool to have a husband with a recording studio, gotta say. Yeah, I mean... That's what I like to do, and and quality, again, quality, not just music, but also equipment, yep, and uh, makes it feel like the, we're, we're really trying to put our best out there, yeah, so as we go, we're going to try to, you know, continually build on that, and uh, the content also improves, it also uh, benefits, that's the word I was looking for. The content benefits, and we benefit by your comments and hitting that like button or smash it. Subscribe. Again, I know most of you are watching on YouTube, so go ahead and do those things if you want. Share this video with your friends. I think that's all for me. Any last comments? No last comments. All right. 
Thank you, Jeremy, for being on and thank you for setting up everything. I hope you all enjoyed this episode. Be sure to like and share with your friends. Be sure to like and share this podcast with your friends. And I hope you continue listening. This has been Teach Talk with the Fine Arts. Bye.